based on these values, we get uh, a T value of 1.70 and the P value is 0.19. So what do we conclude? Is, it, is there a significant uh, improvement in these people or not? Okay, I hear some, I see, I see some heads saying no. Okay, so basically according to these values we that we analyzed, the, the P value is 0.19, which is above 0.05, so we concluded that it doesn't uh, go below the point of no return, so there's no significant difference between these, these two sets of measures. So basically there's no improvement. These, these two, you know, basically these two samples came from the same population. Kind of to show you the advantage of having uh, a good correlation, if the, um, um, if the correlation R went up to 0.90, all of a sudden, the t-test would go to 3.92, and the p-value would be 0.03. Yeah? I, I just made it up. Magic. So now that, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, one thing, okay, sorry. One so the question was, how could you have a situation where um, you could actually arrange for um, a correlation to go from, say, 0.45 to 0.90, or something like that? You know, I made this up, but basically uh, one situation that comes to mind is that instead of A1C, you might have a, a better marker that's more reliable, which would have a better correlation between the pre and the, and the post measure. So it's always important when you're, you're, you know, when you're designing something like this to come with up with the best measure that's going to have the, 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 first of all, it's going to be reliable. There's less messiness or less variability. So that means that you're, you're going to have, um, wind up with a smaller standard deviation and you're more likely to have a higher um, uh, correlation coefficient. Okay, so that's, that would be one way of uh, where that situation would come, uh, would arise. Okay, so in the case where the, correlation coefficient is 0.90, um, we would get a significant difference between the two sets of measures. Okay. So I'm going to jump into analysis of variance if there are no questions about t-tests. Um, t-tests are nice. The only thing is that um, more often than not, we're not just working with two sets of, of measures or two sets of two groups um, that are being measured. Um, a lot of times we work with more than two groups and Presumably, we could use a, a, a t-test to measure or do comparisons among all these groups. So, for example, if we had, um, believe it or not, a, well, I, I get around, so in my work with um, the Center for um, 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 Health and Healing, we do a lot of work with complementary medicine. So, one of the studies we're doing is, is looking at um, acupuncture and lower back surgery. So, and in fact, we do have three groups. One actually gets acupuncture. Another group gets a standard orientation about dealing with pain. And another group just gets stuck with needles. And so the idea is, okay, is there something real about acupuncture? Or is it like a very, is, is it just a strong placebo effect? And people will react to needles being stuck in them. You know, and so, I mean, there's a real, uh, real concern, especially for people who do complementary medicine. medicine. They want to make sure that they're doing as careful a job as possible. They want to show that this is due to the actual manipulation of the needles and not just you know, using people as, as pin cushions, okay? So in this case, we've got three groups and we could do multiple t-tests. We could do um, t-tests between group one and two, one and three, two and three. The problem there is that it's a little bit like playing lotto. The more tests you do, the more likely it is you'll get a significant difference just by chance. So ba what basically happens is that when you do multiple groups like that, this with a t-test, you wind up you no longer have one single uh, p-value on one significance level of 0.05. Uh, you actually wind up with multiple p-values, and what happens is that your significance level, if you just treat, if you don't do anything else, becomes higher than 0.05. It's called um, um, al it's called alpha slippage. So basically, you want to have some way of making sure that no matter how many tests you do, you want to have the same you want to have one single p-value and one significance level you're going to be compar comparing that p-value to. Okay, and this is what, th what you get with the analysis of variance. So basically, 
the analysis of variance does the same thing as a t-test. And as a matter of fact, if you did an analysis of variance for two groups, you should get the same p-value you'd get for a t-test. But what the analysis of variance does is it compares all groups simultaneously and tests whether there's any significant difference between any two, two means. So it, we'll see whether it's between one and two, one and three, two and three. Okay? And this is what the, um, this is what the F, t this is done with an, uh, what's called an F test. And basically, it looks pretty much like a T test. There's um, something that's measuring in the, d in the numerator the amount of um, variability there is between your groups. And then the denominator is measuring how much variability there is within your groups. So before we had a T test where we were comparing a difference between the groups in terms of their means. Here we're actually measuring differences between the groups in terms of, of the variance or the variability between the groups. And let me see, show you how this works. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, you, you, could, you could see it as uh, standard deviation. Basically, what I'm playing within the group is, uh, let's take the red group. This is its variability within each the group. Here's the variability for the green group. And here's the variability for the blue group. So basically, we've got variability within each, in e within each of those groups. And that variability is causing that overlap. Okay? But there's some variability that's due to the fact you've got differences in the means between your groups. And so what you want to do is measure how much variability there is in the means or in the means of those groups, or, or that's contributed by the means of those groups, versus how much variability there is within each group, which is just the overlap among the groups. So let me show you a situation where basically there's no difference between your groups in terms of their means. And so all the, all the variability you're seeing is just due to the variance or variability within each group. So in this case, there's no, there are no differences in the means of your groups. And so basically, um, it's a bit like the, the t-test we had where the two groups had the same mean. Here we've got three groups with the same mean. There's no variability due to the me differences between means. And so basically, it's going to be pretty likely, like you know, p-value equal to point, you know, 1.00, that these groups came all from the same population. Whereas if we look back at this one, there's a greater likelihood, since there are differences between the means, some of the variability is being contributed, uh, some of the overall variability is due to differences be, uh, among the means. And so if we do the, the F test for this, and by the way, there's um, another calculator for um, calculating F tests just with this information. So if you have the, the means, the standard deviations, and the N sizes, you can calculate the F test for a simple analysis of variance like this. And what you find is that the F test gives you is 17.70, uh, is wowee. P value is 0 0.001 or less than. So you've got, you've got a significant difference in among your groups. The problem is the F test is what's called an omnibus test. It does all these, con all these um, comparisons simultaneously. And it just tells you there's some significant difference there. It doesn't tell you where. So it could be between one and two, one and three, two and three. You don't know. Okay? And so um, in a certain sense, the F test or the analysis of variance is just the first step in your analysis. And then in the second test, the second step of the analysis, you actually have to determine where those differences are. And presumably, you could go back and just do your t-test but you, you have the problem where, again, it's, you're playing lotto. If you do multiple t-tests, you're, you're, um, you're going to be likely to find a significant difference just by chance. Way back in the 50s and 60s, they came up with something called post hoc tests, which basically are kind of like t-tests, only they're very strict, and they do all possible um, comparisons among your means. And basically, there's it makes sure that your, your, your p-values are 
uh, your overall p-value is going to be less than 0.05. Um, I'm sorry, if your, your significance level is going to be less than is going to be less than 0.05. Okay, I don't want to dwell too much on post-op tests because people don't tend to use it too much anymore. Um, a lot, I mean, I, I usually if you see a paper that has post-op tests, you can tell when the, this person was trained because it's they, they were obviously trained like you know between the 60s and 70s, which is kind of when I was trained. So um, I don't want to dwell too much on them, but for one of the problems with post-op tests is that they do all possible, they're very strict in terms of like their p-values and their significance levels, and they also do all possible comparisons, and there are a lot of times when all the possible comparisons aren't of interest to you. So what do you do instead? Well, there's a kind of post-op test that's called the Boncoroni correction. And I've been in classes where anytime the, the word, the name Boncoroni came up, everyone laughed. So you're allowed to laugh if you want. Okay, hooray for Boncoroni. I mean. um, so basically, the, the, the principle of the Boncoroni correction is you um, count up how many comparisons you're making. So if you've got three groups, you're doing three comparisons. So you then divide the number of comparisons you're making into your significance level. So 3 into 0 0.05 is 0 0.0167, okay? That 0 0.0167 is going to be your significance level for each of your comparisons. So instead of 0 0.05, you're going to have a significance level of 0 0.0167 for the comparison you make between group 1 and 2, same thing for group 1 and 3, and for 2 and 4, okay? This is kind of the, s the not too smart way of using a Boncoroni correction, but this is this basically shows you the, the principle of using a Boncoroni correction for all possible comparisons. So the multiple of the fact that you get the other group is the fact that you get the Yep. So basically, you get if you have four groups, you're going to have six pairs to do. If you got five groups, you got ten pairs, and so on. So basically, if you use the Boncoroni correction for and do all possible corrections, you're really killing yourself. You're, you're really going to be reducing your, your chances of finding a significant difference because your, your significance level is going to be so small. And so one of the, you know, the wise thing to do is just to pick those comparisons that you're interested in doing. Um, so let's see, do I have an example here? No. Okay. So for example, in um, let's say this one, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, I've got yet another study, another clinical trial where I've got three groups, and I've got um, these are patients with renal problems. Um, one group is, ge is given fish oil, another group is given extra virgin olive oil. It's being sponsored by the, um, um, the Italian trade group, and um, another group gets mineral oil. Okay, and so basically, what you might decide is that um, you're not too, you know, you might not be too interested in um, comparing, say. Um, say fish oil versus olive oil, but you, you might just compare fish oil versus mineral oil, which is mineral oil can be your placebo, and then you might go on and, and compare your uh, extra virgin olive oil versus mineral oil. So basically you have two comparisons. So what do you think your significance level is going to be then? Five divided, point oh five divided by two. So 0.025, okay? So basically, you, f you know, in choosing the comparisons you make, you, you make a priori uh, choices about which comparisons to make, and that, you know, you're still gonna be controlling for the number of comparisons you're making, but you're not gonna be killing yourself as much as if you do all possible comparisons, okay? And so more often than not, you'll see in articles, they'll cite the fact that they decided to do a priori or pre-planned comparisons with a Boncoroni correction, and they'll actually mention which comparisons they, they chose to make. And that's what they're supposed to do. Okay. Now let's actually talk about this. Um, we now go into, we, we, we had one-way analysis of variance where we had one factor or one possible way of, of grouping patients. We're now gonna go into multi-way analysis of variance. Uh, where we have more than one factor. And 